Check, check. Check. Can y'all hear me all right? Okay, great. One, two, one, two. Can you hear me now? Check a check, check. Turn you up. It is on. Okay, one more. Checking, checking. Hello, everybody. Hi. Can you hear me in the back? Holla. Okay, guest mic. That's good. Yeah, let's, let's all be comfortable. So, again, thank you again for everybody for coming out bright and early this morning here to uh, the Keen Cinemas. And thanks to Keen Cinemas uh, for having this event here, which was fantastic. They did a great job. Uh, so really appreciate everybody showing up. I did a count, and we had about 47 people in the theater this morning, which, you know, not bad for... 9 a.m. On a, on a Saturday morning, and, uh, and again, thanks to everybody for coming out. I don't know, if, is there anything that you want to just, you know, throw out there before we open it up to questions? Uh, yeah, well, sure. Well, first, I, I wanted to uh, let people know that, uh, you know, some of the shots in this movie are hard to follow. A lot of them are shaky. wanted to let you know that this wasn't originally intended to be a film. It just sort of ended up happening that way. Um, so just wanted to let you know if you had any questions about like, well, what, who was your cameraman? Why, were, why are some of those shots so darn shaky like when I was in Philadelphia? Uh, that's because uh, I was just walking around with some of my personal like wearable video cameras. So wanted to let folks know about that first. Well, sometimes when uh, you're in a situation where there are aggressors who are threatening to put you in a cage, uh, and it's, if it's cold out on top of that, you know, the adrenaline is flowing and it, it is hard to keep a, a steady shot. So that's, that's understandable. And I don't think that, I don't think it, lent, you know, really detracted from the film at all. I think it's a, it's an impactful movie, which I heard a lot of laughter in the audience. I don't know if anyone cried uh, today, but it's definitely, it's definitely a movie that, uh, that can work your emotions. And I think that uh, it's very successful at doing that. Yeah, well, great. So, yeah, hopefully it wasn't a deterrent, uh, having the, the shaky cams. So, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to come on up to this microphone. Don't be shy. Uh, Brad Jardis coming up here all the way up. Yeah, you, you probably came the farthest. I don't know, uh, from what, the North Country to come out here today? Basically Canada, eh? Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Kelly, Kelly Voluntarius, too, is one of the stars of the film. Uh, she came all the way from Arizona Kelly. to come out here. Uh, so yeah, throw out the question, go for it, and uh, in case you don't know, this is Derek J. Freeman, I'm Ian Freeman, I produce the movie, and of course he's the star. So here's my question for you, Derek. Um, in New Hampshire, using a vehicle against somebody is considered deadly force, and the way you were arrested by Officer Moore, um, I have questions whether or not the police can lawfully detain someone to hand you paperwork. Uh, because of a federal case, but they certainly can't detain you to hand you paperwork that you've been handed earlier in the day. So my question to you is, um, have you considered suing the Keene police? Uh, not that you want to make it personal, but I think the only way that change is really going to happen at the uh, boots on the ground law enforcement level is if uh, financial pressure is put on the local municipalities, and um, I think that if they were to get away with behaving like this, I think it would be very unjust. So I'm just interested in what you think. Thank you for your question, Brad, and thanks for coming out all the way from Canada today, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question, and it's a question I get a lot. Uh, I hope everyone was able to hear it. Basically, it was, why uh, have I, consider have I considered uh, suing um, individuals or um, the Keene Police Department for the way in which I was detained, at least during the Moore arrest? Um, at the end where I was riding my bicycle there. And uh, the, the short answer is yes. Yes, I've considered suing them because, of course, I, f I feel like I was wronged uh, and assaulted. I even said that on video, you know, while it was happening, you just assaulted me. Um, and I don't think it would be inappropriate because, of course, people respond to incentives. And uh, if I am just, you know, I, I, part of me wants to just turn the other cheek and say, okay, I'm going to be the the better person here take the mild, moral high ground and just say what you did was wrong and I can just forgive you and move on. But if um, 
the Keen police keep aggressing against people, I, I really feel like something has to be done um, to let them know that uh, peaceful people aren't going to take it and that there are going to be peaceful consequences. Um, a lot of lawyers have, have emailed me and after they see the film and they say, you know, like, you really have to do something. So yeah, that's something I'm considering, but I don't know step one, you know. I, Maybe I know. Brad could move to Keene and help us uh, with that <laughs> process. <laughs> That would be awesome, Brad. How about it? So, yeah, if uh, anyone knows anything about how the stuff... I don't know step one, honestly, about filing paperwork or doing whatever it needs to be done to, to sue somebody. Uh, that's just not my bag. But if someone is more knowledgeable in that area, yeah, email me at uh, DerekJFreeman at gmail.com. Lauren Canario. Woo! Well, to your credit, Derek, that you don't know anything about suing people. Very good. Uh, I, I was impressed with uh, how you always brought out the message of peace and uh, nonviolence and uh, asked everyone else to participate in the, in the, uh, the peacefulness. And that, I think that's great. And uh, I was wondering, my question is that uh, you're going to be on your exile tour soon and you're probably thinking about all the details about that. I was wondering about after the exile, are you still thinking of coming back to Keene? Oh, yes. Thank you for the question, Lauren. Yes, I will be back in Keene. There is no question in my mind. Uh, I came here and, uh, you know, I was inspired by the videos of, of freedom activists like yourself, Lauren. You know, <laughs> seeing those videos is uh, so inspiring. And so I definitely had to move here. I still feel the same way about Keene. I absolutely love it. I love the community here. Um, it's unparalleled in anything that I've experienced before and I feel unsafe right now. It's, it stinks uh, that I feel like I have to leave this area um, that I love so dearly uh, because I'm in constant fear that the Keene police are going to come and aggress against me again and they could, they could aggress for any reason. Uh, those of us who have had interactions with law enforcement know that they do whatever they want and they ask questions later and so uh, you know, that's, that's a dangerous position for someone to be in who has a suspended sentence of, you know, three years in jail. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay away for a little while, and then I will be back in New Hampshire. No question. Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> we have Kelly Voluntarius, who was uh, in the film and was arrested with Derek and I at the courthouse uh, arrest. In fact, Kelly and I, just as an aside, will be having a trial on Monday morning at 10 a.m. at Keene District Court. So if you're in town, Feel free to stop in and uh, and see us there, Kelly. Yes. Hey, Derek. Get close on that mic, please, so hey, our Derek. listeners at home can hear you. Okay, check check. So uh, I've been a little bit out of the loop back in Arizona. Um, so I was wondering uh, what the schedule for your exile tour is. Oh well, thanks for asking. Yeah, the uh, schedule for the exile tour it began uh, August uh, yeah August eighteenth in Washington, D.C. with the Raw Milk Freedom Rally. Uh, those of you who are subscribed to my YouTube channel can check that out, or you can check it out on my uh, libertyontour.com blog and also livefreerdance.com. Uh, but then I was invited by Adam Kokesh of uh, Adam vs. the Man to come and participate in Washington, D.C. on a 20-minute, uh, uh, five-day-a-week comedy news show, and I... Uh, I'm looking forward to that opportunity for over the next four months. When I realized I was going to be in D.C. for four months, though, I said, oh my gosh, I only have until December 20th to finish my community service hours, um, you know, to pay off this fine. That's why, uh, in addition to being here for the premiere, that's why I'm in New Hampshire, was to finish my community service hours. And uh, I just accomplished that uh, yesterday. Yesterday I just finished up. And so I'll be heading to D.C. again Tuesday, and on weekends I'll be able to tour uh, some parts of the country, and uh, folks can follow along at libertyontour.com. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you. Rich Paul, come on up. Don't be shy. Hi. Uh, this is uh, as much an announcement, or more, more an announcement than a question, but... If uh, people here are interested in seeing more activism like this going on, uh, there are, I'm facing uh, five felony charges right now and uh, for distribution of marijuana. We've just had a manufacturer of marijuana charge nullified by a jury. That means, 
Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Kathleen Converse, for inspiring them, too. Um, right, there was a Free State Project participant on that jury that yes, nullified. Yes, Kathleen Converse is a Free Stater who talked the rest of the jury into nullifying. I'm going to be trying to do the same thing. Um, I'm going to be saying ignore the facts of the case and judge the law wrong. And what I need in order to encourage jurors to do that is to have a lot of activists out there, a lot of people showing that this is an important issue to them. And in order for that to happen, I'm asking people here both to come out for the event and also donate to the 420 Foundation, which is uh, coordinating my defense. And that's at 420foundation.chipin.com. Awesome. Great. And what is the date again on that uh, trial, Rich? Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I believe it's September 26, which is kind of funny because it's the anniversary of my very first uh, arrest oh at the uh, 420 rally. Uh, but there are Facebook events for both of these, so look for uh, Rich Paul jury selection and Rich Paul final pre-talk trial hearing. Uh, also like the 420 Foundation on Facebook, and that'll help you keep up with what's going on. Cool. 420 Foundation on Facebook. So uh, I have a question for you, Derek, while we wait for someone else. I don't know if Michelle Seven was going to come up here. She looked like she was. You don't have You can come up now if you want. Yeah, please don't hold back. Just uh, form a line. If, you know, if there are that many questions. Um, go ahead, Michelle Hi, Seven. Sure. Hi. So I have two questions. Uh, one, how, in what ways do you feel as though your activism created greater freedom for more people than just yourself, maybe. And two, what do you say to people who, um, whether within this community or outside this community who are going to be watching your video, who might say, um, I don't know, not be critical necessarily, but think you guys are dealing with first world problems. You are talking about wanting to smoke pot in Central Square when in Sudan, eight-year-old children are being required to uh, club their mothers to death or cut off their father's hands in front of them, which is clearly, you know, much greater crime than being restricted from smoking weed in Central Square. So what do you say to those people? And then the first question was, how do you feel that your activism has increased liberty and freedom for more than just yourself? Beautiful. Thank you so much for your questions, uh, Michelle Seven, and um, an another one of the featured participants in the film. So the two questions, uh, the first one was how has uh, my activism enhanced the freedoms of others? And my answer to that is that uh, freedom is always within. Freedom's always inside of you. So there's nothing that I could do to give you more freedom because it's always inside of you. But the things that I think I've done is remind people what they already know, that uh, they do have the freedom to act as they see fit and to act on their conscience. And uh, I think it's in encouraging for uh, others to see um, people acting uh, free. So that's, I'm, does that answer the first question for you, Michelle? Is that, uh, you know, I haven't enhanced freedom for others. Uh, they can only do it for themselves. And so hopefully uh, by watching the film or uh, by seeing that people are acting free, then they will be inspired to do the same. And the, the second, um, remind me, it was about... First world problems. Oh, yeah, first world problems. Sure, well, you know, I'm from the first world. So this is where, this is, these are the types of problems that I tackle. Uh, it wouldn't feel right for me to pull a George Clooney and go to Sudan and like, sure, I care about human problems everywhere, but th those aren't the things that I interact with. I feel like it's uh, important to handle the issues that are relevant to my life. And uh, well, we can have the opposing. biggest effect on the area in which we live. And uh, you know, I've come up against this objection as well. Uh, well, why don't you guys care more about people around the world? It's not that I don't care about those people. It's that I can only affect my little corner of it. And I want to do everything I can to help the people that are in my little corner of the world. And to say that uh, you know, the first world doesn't have legitimate problems is not fair uh, because you know, we're dealing with issues like drug prohibition 
where people are having their lives destroyed on a regular basis. They're being put in cages, they're being sep separated from their families, they're being taken away from their jobs, and in some cases killed uh, because of drug prohibition. So to, to, to minimize that is really insulting to those you know, 1.5 million people who had their lives destroyed destroyed or disturbed significantly just within the last year. And so I don't think it's, it's fair to, uh, you know, to say that people around the world, you know, their problems are more important than the problems that we're having here. So we can only focus on so much. Bo Davis just uh, walked in, so I'm glad hey. that we're going to have him joining us. Uh, there is a third chair out there. If somebody wants to grab that other folding chair uh, right outside of the table, that little uh, card table out there, that way Bo can, can have a seat up here. Uh, if somebody can handle that, that'd be great. There is a third microphone, I think, down there on the ground. Uh, Bo Davis is the editor of this film, and uh, he did this for pennies. Uh, he, you know, is a professional. Bo went to college uh, in Florida. Was it uh, Fort Myers? Which college did you, uh, did you go Institute to? The Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, and uh, so he's professionally trained uh, at this editing thing, and he did an absolutely splendid job and did it for next to, next to zero. I mean, it was a little bit more than zero, but, uh, but not much. The total budget of this whole film, uh, including the equipment that we used to do the editing, it was $2,000. Uh, so, Bo, thank you for putting countless hours into wow. making this the fantastic uh, presentation that it, that it is. Not a problem. I, I really appreciate like uh, everything. Close, close. Oh, close. just talk real close. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah, thanks. No, and and Derek uh, had had done all you know, shot all this video and done all this activism and everything for the for the year that he was here, and 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 it was just it was a really awesome experience to be able to cut all this stuff together, and and tie this story up. So I I, I really appreciated uh, every little bit of uh, of intricacy you've put into your your life and and documenting it and and just creating this wonderful experience to share. Well, yeah, then thanks for uh, putting it all together, Bo. No problem. So, so we still have time for more questions. Right. Allie, uh, Allie Havens. Uh, I have a question for Derek and Bo. My question to Derek is, I think everyone's sort of wondering, how did you remain so positive throughout all of this? Like, do you have tips or techniques for getting through these types of things? And my question to Bo is, uh, where do you see this film going? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for your question, Ali. Um, how did I stay so positive throughout um, these events and continuing, you know, throughout jail and, and onward? Um, I think having an attitude of positivity takes practice and um, focus. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard the example that our minds are like gardens, and if uh, one isn't constantly weeding the garden, then weeds are going to just naturally grow, and uh, in a negative attitude can sort of just take over. Um, I, I found that to be true in my life, and so I, uh, my tips uh, that you ask for are just to uh, be mindful of um, where you are, what you're doing, and uh, that uh, this too shall pass. So when there are bad things happening, like I said I was really scared when I was going into jail, but it sure did pass. Here I am out of jail now, so everything's fine, and uh, just remembering that everything's okay. You know, if I can add to that a little bit, I, I, uh, I feel like you kind of have to almost observe your mind to some extent, um, and when the ne those negative weeds, if you will, come up, you have to pluck them, and mentally, you know, that means shifting away from the negative thoughts that might be coming in and choosing positive ones instead. And uh, for me, that's been really effective over time, and it is something that, that takes practice. And uh, as far as far as where I see the movie going, um, <laughs> honestly, I, I didn't. I mean, I, I anticipated the uh, the amount of uh, uh, coverage it was going to get on the internet, and um, and and I, I really saw like a it's funny looking at looking at it now. I see like twenty thousand hits on there, and and, and it's really exciting, you know. Like, <laughs> um, and then to see this many people out here for the premiere, it's really it's really a wonderful thing. I I think it's only going to get bigger, and I I, I uh, see producing more of these types of films. Um, I honestly I think there ought to be a, a prequel and a sequel to this thing. And <laughs> so um, I I. I think it's going to go big, and uh, a lot of people are going to be inspired by uh, the activism that's happened here. Uh, I like 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. I like the idea of the uh, the sequel, and one of the reasons why I registered victimlesscrimespree.com instead of Derek J's victimlesscrimespree.com, besides it being shorter and easier to remember, is that you know there's no reason why we couldn't have Rich Paul's victimless crime spree or you know whoever else might be uh, the next uh, civil disobedience star, uh, if you will. So who knows? Well, we don't know what's going to come in the future for this, but uh, at least as far as other films are concerned. But as far as Derek J's victimless crime spree is concerned, I'm proud to announce that uh, yesterday I signed the agreement for the DVD. So it's coming to DVD. Uh, that'll be happening later this year because, you know, it's old media, so it takes time to make these things happen. Uh, you know, Bo is going to be working. Uh, he actually just put the finishing touches on the director's cut, uh, which is a little bit different. You know, we're, we, we trimmed a few scenes back and we added a few scenes in. Uh, let's see, there's new music in the director's cut, so it's going to be a completely new soundtrack. And one of the things that's nice about that is the director's cut edition will have what's called royalty-free music. So you'll be able to take that version and, uh, you know, display it in a movie theater or you'd be able to uh, you know sell it or whatever and nobody on the soundtrack is going to uh, to have a problem with that so that's an important thing so like if we want to get on Netflix it's gotta have that royalty free music and the distributor that we're we're picking up for the DVD has you know the connections that are necessary I can't say for sure we're going to make it on Netflix at this point but that's it becomes more possible like that we actually have an actual disc that can be sent to them, that's, that's important. Uh, Amazon, I believe, will be carrying the product. So we'll, we'll know more uh, as we get closer to the release date, which should be sometime in January of 2013 for the, uh, the director's cut on DVD. And of course, you know, like any good DVD, uh, we'll put, uh, we'll put the, the activism scenes that were long, obviously, much longer than what you saw in the film. Uh, we're gonna try to put as many of those on the disc as possible. If this thing, this interview here turns out decent, I don't know about the lighting situation, but if it turns out all right, we'll put that on the disc. And we are, after this today, after the lunch in the park, by the way, hopefully you'll join us for that, uh, the three of us are going to go and record a commentary track for the film. So, that's, you know, it's kind of the, the fun DVD things that uh, some people like to, uh, to see. We're, we're going to have all that. Uh, so, if there are any other questions, I think we may have, I see somebody in the back there who does, that's excellent. Uh, come right on up, and then uh, we'll just wrap this up after any other questions that uh, y'all might have. And I believe it was it Greg, if I'm recalling yeah, correctly. Feel Greg. free to tilt that mic up towards you there, since you're right. pretty tall. Uh, Thank you. I really like the part with the thanks but no tanks part. I was wondering if you could go through that sequence of events of how you got that to work well, and how someone could use that as a kind of a template to do activism in the area. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Greg, for the question, and uh, it was about. How did thanksbutnotanks.com come about? Um, I imagine, like, how, how was it a successful campaign? Uh, I think. Right. Um, well, I don't know how I initially heard about the tank coming to town. Does anyone? I mean, I'm sure with an audience like this, someone remembers <laughs> how the first news of it came about. I guess it was through Clarky, um, who heard that his dad had said no, he had been the only no vote uh, against the tank. And it started with that and a petition that he ran where he got uh, 400 signatures uh, plus signed from members of the community. Right? It, it was one of those things that all happened, but it was, it, it's such a big, uh, the Thanks But No Tanks campaign is such a, uh, it, it's, it's so wide in scope. It's, it's hard to say that, you know, there wasn't one person orchestrating that and saying, well, you go do this and then you go do that. Uh, it was it was kind of like the premiere of this film where I you know we put it out there that this was going to happen and then I didn't tell Garrett Ian to go out and start chalking or Daryl to go out and chalk on the sidewalks in downtown Keene to advertise this film happening. So the same thing with Thanks But No Tanks is that uh, you know what we have and one of the strengths of this movement is uh, the liberty movement in New Hampshire is that it's decentralized. So yes, we're all combining our efforts in one geographic location, but nobody's in charge. So everybody just does what they think is most effective. So Clarkey, you know, did the petition and a bunch of people went out, including myself, we went out and we got those petition signatures. There were flyers that were printed up. Jason Talley came up with thanksbutnotanks.com. Uh, and, you know, there was media being produced in various different aspects, going out to various different uh, delivery methods from YouTube to Freaking TV. 
And it's just, you know, you can't even really put your thumb on any one thing or one person that, that did it. And of course, ultimately, you know, they got the tank anyway. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of outreach and a lot of, I think, I think the success of the Thanks But No Tanks campaign was that most people agreed with it. Uh, the supermajority of people in town, something like 80, 90 percent of people in Keene were on board. So whether they're left or right or neither, uh, a lot of folks uh, were on board with those with the idea of rejecting that. So there's no one answer to that question. Well, yeah, and I see it. Uh, it was uh, you mentioned there were so many different facets, so many so many uh, uh, parts going into that campaign. Um, that really is like the beauty that is the the fact that uh, it wasn't you're, you no know, none of us really like felt alone in our efforts, you know like we we really I mean even though they they got the tank or whatever, uh, I think we set a precedent in the town. Uh, well, not a precedent in the town, but also a precedent uh, nationwide. Right. Sure. In that Keene was the very first place that Lenko, uh, the company that manufactures these tanks, uh, that Lenko had ever had any kind of pushback. Anybody. No one anywhere else besides Keene ever had any kind of organized in any fashion opposition to uh, this thing. And they even brought their head salesman into one of those city council meetings to where he could uh, you know, try to keep the sale, uh, basically, because they were nervous they were going to lose the sale. And uh, they never, the, the head salesman told me they'd never experienced anything like, like what happened here. And I know that wouldn't have been possible without the great, some of the great folks that are in this audience uh, tonight or today. It's the morning still. Uh, but uh, so we're almost out of time here. I think we might have time for one more question. If there's anyone else with a question for uh, Derek or Bo or, uh, or just an observation, something you want to share. Otherwise, I had one question for you, Derek. Was it worth it? I think this is the question that everybody or a lot of people like to ask. You know, you spent 60 days in jail. Uh, there's hundreds of days over your head that uh, they're holding over you on a suspended sentence. Was it worth it? I wouldn't trade this experience for anything, no. It was absolutely worth it. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that for a second. Even while I was in jail, I was um, so gleeful and, and smiley because I knew that uh, this, this was exactly what I wanted to be doing. And so, yes, it was, it was worth it. And I hope that all of you enjoyed as well. All right, so we're going to uh, clean things up. Remember, as you're getting up, there is that uh, wire going down the aisle, so be very mindful of that. Uh, park, Ashwela Park. If you don't know where it is, it's uh, right on the corner of Island Street and West Street here in Keene, just down the road, just a short bit. Uh, Daryl, I believe you've got sandwiches, chips, $3 and drinks. Three dollars for a bag lunch. Sandwich, chips, and drink, or bring your own if you don't like that. Uh, but it sounds great. What kind of sandwiches? There's bologna and cheese, and if you do not like meat, if you're one of those vegetable-tarian people, I have Nutella sandwiches. Awesome. We'll look forward to seeing you at Ashwell Park, uh, 1215.